Are we all comfortable? Yeah. Even even the murderer? Okay, so tonight is a, a particularly absurd challenge for me um, because, uh, brief, brief history lesson, um, I promise it'll be very brief. Uh, the pianoforte was invented in Italy about 300 years ago and it improved on the harpsichord in two big ways. One, you could play softly or loudly, piano forte, and two, you could sustain notes with a pedal. You could hit a note and remove your finger and it would continue to ring due to this sustain pedal. My piano sustain pedal is broken, <laughs> um, so I really have no business playing it. Uh, it's sort of like, uh, what did I say to you earlier about the, oh, it's like being in a horse race but your horse has three legs. Um, so why join the race? Like, stupid, just dumb. <laughs> yeah. um, and you couldn't play like most piano music. Oh yeah, we should shut off our phones. That's a good idea. Good. <laughs> most, most piano music relies on the sustain pedal um, because that's what it was invented for. So like, if I played like a uh, Moonlight Sonata with no sustain pedal, it'd be... It's, you can't, the, the notes aren't moving, you know? I mean, they're not, it's not flowing. So I had to choose music tonight that could be played with no sustain pedal. Something very staccato and quick, which is why I chose Zez Confrey, if you have a... Flyer. Does anyone raise your hand if you don't know who that is? Yeah. That's it. It's most like more than half, and it's what I expected. And it's and it's so sad because it's so sad that he he's fallen into such obscurity. He was a composer who wrote uh, post ragtime and pre jazz, um, and he specialized in what's called novelty piano, which sounds like. Uh, yeah. Got it. Like Got it. All right. All right. Ooh, dexterity. All right. I'm good for tonight. <laughs> and bunny. <laughs> um, novelty piano is is as it sounds. It's really really fun fun music, and I've been having a great time with this. It's fun and funny music, but it shouldn't be written off as just like comic strip like stupid music because uh, he was actually a really great composer. Um, I can give you the. One second bio, maybe, if I find it, here we go. Zez Confrey was born Edward Elzear Confrey. Why don't we name our children Elzear anymore? That's an awesome name. <laughs> uh, in April 1895 in Peru, Illinois, died 1971. That's all I'll talk about him. Um, <laughs> um, the first piece is from something called the African Suite, which has three pieces in it, and this is the second one called Kinda Careless. Or is it? Um, because it's come to my attention that number two, Kinda Careless, and number three, Mississippi Shivers, were originally published, and the publishers fucked up and swap, swapped the titles. So this, and then, and then in a later edition, they swapped them back, and then in a later edition, they swapped them back wrong again. So it's just swipsy swapsies with, uh, with this. So this is either... Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is either kind of careless or either kind of careless or Mississippi Shivers. Guess we'll never know. <laughs> This is what we, in the industry, call E flat. <laughs> Welcome to it. <laughs> What's going on right now uh, is that <laughs> he is firmly grounding us in E flat as the tonic, as home. He wants you to know where home is, because things are going to get weird in a second. And uh, he wants you to know there's somewhere safe to return to. He's, he has your safety and in mind. He's a very considerate composer that way. 
But in 1924, there was this new thing called the blues scale. But in 1924, to be a white dude writing in the blues scale was edgy as fuck. <laughs> have a vague idea of how much fun he's, he's having with his music, right? Um, and at no time is he going to have more fun than this next piece, which has a great little backstory to it, if you want to hear it. Um, okay, so the legend, the story goes, he uh, lived in an apartment, I think in Peru, Illinois, and the apartment's here, and down the street is a bar, and in the bar is a coin-operated player piano, a Nickelodeon, and you can hear that piano in his apartment. Great. Problem is, the piano in the bar was kind of broken. Um, and I imagine it like kind of stopped and started in fits, or you know, transposed to the wrong key, or played the wrong notes, or played too quickly or too slowly. Nightmare uh, if you're trying to compose in your own, off in your own uh, apartment and you have to listen to this down the street. So the way I figure, there's three ways you could deal with this problem. Four, I just thought of another. Um, you could, <laughs> you could ignore it. Good luck. Good luck. You could move. Pain in the ass. You could be a complaining Karen and go talk to the manager. Don't be a complaining Karen. Not you, Karen. <laughs> or four, you could write a piece of music that specifically mimics and mocks the sound of the broken piano down the street. And that's what he did. And this piece is called Nickel in the Slot, because of course it is, right? <laughs> nope. <laughs> See, it's already broken. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
talk briefly about this thing in music called prosody and prosody is where the music and the lyrics are conveying the same message um, and like the most common basic thing that you'll hear in like most pop music is if you're singing a song and the melody goes hi on the word hi and then later it goes no. that, that's prosody it's music and, and lyrics like presenting the same thought in in their own languages um, but there's another kind of prosody if you don't if you're dealing with something without lyrics, and that's if a piece of music is specifically trying to evoke another thing. Like maybe that last one, you could stretch the term and call that prosody because he's trying to sound like the broken piano down the street. And this next one is called Grandfather's Clock, and it's supposed to sound like a clock. Um, this one is a sing-along. <laughs> uh, and you're welcome to join in. If you need a refresher on the lyrics to Grandfather's Clock, um, I, I can give you that. Um, it's just one line, and it's very simple. It goes, it goes, Grandfather's Clock goes tick tock, tick tock. That's it. You want to try it? Ready? Grandfather's Clock goes tick tock, tick tock. Oh, Renee Fleming's, all of you. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> Okay, so this, uh, this piece is supposed to sound like a clock. To me, it sounds like a clock ticking down. It sounds like time passing by. And this sweet little introduction is like a flashback where your screen goes wavy. And you think, uh, 1933, why, I remember it like it was only yesterday. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, sticking with uh, with prosody, this is another one that's trying to evoke a very specific image. And this one goes by the adorable title of Mouse's Hooves. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if you got one of these, the um, little bar of music on the bottom, that's the mouse running up the keyboard. Aww. And uh, he's a speedy little devil. And uh, he's a sassy little guy too, because once once he does that a few times, he actually starts singing. Nya, 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 nya. It goes like. Uh, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Mouse is hooves. not knowing who this guy was. He's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> He's amazing. Okay, let's see. The next one, oh, all right. The next one's kind of special to me because I started poking at it uh, last spring, um, early pandemic when we were all, nobody knew how long this was going to go on, you know, and you could be suffering from depression or anxiety or panic attacks or to collect all four, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> So I needed something to take my mind off of the vortex of what was going on last spring. Um, so I started poking at this piece because it met two crucial criteria. One, it was complicated enough that it required 100% of my attention, which is what I was, that was the goal, just get out of my head and focus totally on something else. And two, it's the happiest little piece of music I've ever heard. It may, may be the happiest piece of music ever written arguable but definitely in the top 10 <laughs> and uh, to me it personifies just going do -do 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 down the street without a care in the world it's a do to do down the street song and it's called jaywalk <laughs> I'm going to mess it up <laughs>
down, I'll punish you all, um, uh, with the next piece, which comes from a suite called Moods of a New Yorker. There's four pieces in that, and this is the first one, I think, called At Dusk. And this one actually really could benefit from a sustain pedal. Um, I've been doing pretty well with no sustain pedal so far, because these have all been like super thing. Oh, by the way, this is in the magical world of sheet music. This means pedal down. And then this dating game flower here means <laughs> pedal up. And <laughs> mo awesome. most piano music ha is, has just strings of this under the stab saying, you know, down up, down up, you know. Um, but this is, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing well, I've noticed. You have a problem trying to get your foot over there. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't be everywhere at once. Um, so since I don't have a sustain pedal because I am unsustainable. <laughs> Um, I do have these monstrous hands, which can easily hold down a tenth, uh, so I have to use my freakish hands to create the sustain that's not ha happening in the pedal, which is a lot of extra work for the performer, but I'm willing to do that for you. So this is a kind of a more of an impress. I'm including this because I think it's beautiful, and also it shows another side of Zez Confrey as a composer. Um, because everything's been kind of jolly and happy so far, and this is more like a like an impressionistic watercolor, like Debussy-ish. Um, it's very moody piece, a mood of a New Yorker piece, if you will. Um, yeah. So at dusk. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, it's... I don't know. I picture Dusk in New York, but I think there's a clue in the title, so... <laughs> I think he's leading the witness on that one. But <laughs> okay. Uh, moving right along. Uh, what's next? What's next? Uh, oh, okay. Here's one. Uh, no backstory on this and no lecture on music theory. Sorry. Just a, just a sweet little tune that I'm quite fond of called Arabian Maid from 1935. <laughs> <laughs> take a break from Zez Confrey because I want to tell you about this guy named Vincent Johnson. Now Vincent Johnson is a young fella who lives out west and he plays the same kind of music I do like jo Scott Joplin and Zez Confrey are his biggest influences. Um, he wanted to play piano when he was a kid because of Maple Leaf Rag so that wow. makes three of us right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he puts uh, his performances of you know what he plays on YouTube like I do um, so I've been watching him for years and he's a great um, player like he really know, understands like the ragtime era and like the, he enjoys it he understands the voicing he has the technical capabilities to convey the things he's thinking I often listen to his pieces of like a Joplin piece and like when I'm trying to learn the same piece I'm like oh, I'm gonna steal that idea and steal that I just steal from him all the time um, anyway, he's a great uh, performer. Um, I don't know him or anything. He's just some dude on the internet. Uh, so a few months ago, I put on my YouTube channel my Kind of Careless, or maybe Mississippi Shivers, we don't know. Um, and then I got a comment on that video from Vincent Johnson. And he, t and he said, you know, when they first published it, you know, the, the publishers like messed up and swapped the titles and then swapped them back. Anyway, he's the one who told me the story that I told you guys. 
And I thought it was fascinating. And I also thought, like, well, if you're going to, like, fuck up your printing, then Kind of Careless is a good title, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, God, this is kind of a long story. I'm trying to keep it as short as possible. Um, so we started a correspondence. Um, and after he wrote me that really nice little letter, and I said, you know, um, can you do me a favor? Because, you know, that's what people love on the internet is like strangers asking them for favors. Um, <laughs> but there's a, there's a piece of music I want, and it's not in, it's not in the green book. This is the currently in, in print uh, Zez Confrey, um sheet music book. Um, and it's a great book. It's got like it covers his like career very well. It has his like greatest hits and some really obscure stuff, and uh, it it's a fair representation of who he was. But it doesn't have everything, and everything is all I want. <laughs> Why can't I have everything? So I uh, emailed Vincent and I said, "Can you scan the grandfather clock score and email it to me? Because I really like that piece, but it's not in the green book." And then the next day he did. What a nice guy, right? And also in that email he said, yeah, sorry about that. We had space constrictions in the book. I'm like, what? What do you mean? Who's we? And he's like, oh yeah, I was a contributor to that book. I'm like, what? So I read the email, I read the email and I'm like, oh, wow. oh yeah, there is. Okay. What a small world, right? Wow. So, um, so then he emails me back and he says, by the way, I happen to have this spare copy of the, this like, encyclopedic tome of like 98% of anything Zez Confrey wrote for the piano. Um, now I'm aware of this book. It went out of print in the early 80s. I've been trying to get my hands on a copy for years. It is rare, obscure, and couldn't find it at all. So he says, do you want it? <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> I mean, I sent him a little money, but not nearly enough for what it, what it was worth That's to me. Amazing. Okay, so, so great guy, right? Um, so we're bonding over Zez Confrey. And, um, and then so I told him, actually, that I'm doing um, a Zez Confrey concert night. And he also composes. Um, and he composes ragtime music, like in the beautiful, old, wonderful, strict ragtime format. And I said, I think it would be not inappropriate if I played one of your pieces. Do you have sheet music to your absolutely incredible rags that I, I love so much. They're, uh, they're, uh, they are on par with Scott Joplin. I know that sounds like hyperbole, but they are so, so good. Um, so he sent me his book of music. <laughs> and there are 19 absolute wonderful things in here. So I went through it and said, well, what can I, invincible syncopations. I said, what can I play, what can I learn in time? Because these are like, like serious compositions, like you don't just sit down and like noodle this out. These are like, these take study, and, and some of them are a little beyond me. Um, I said, what can I play in time for tonight? And, um, and of course, what do I not need the pedal for? <laughs> because you often need a pedal in ragtime to play it right. Um, so I chose one, and uh, I really like this one because it may be the only Jewish ragtime song ever written. <laughs> um, it uses what's called the Fregish scale, um, which is to the music theory nerds, it's Phrygian dominant. Um, what is the Fregish scale? And what is a Jewish scale, you're asking? Okay, well, uh, C major, we all know and love. Boring. C minor. A little sadder. And the Fregish scale is. So it's got this, it's got this major third for the happiness, but it's got this lowered second. So it's both like, it's both happy and and dismal, which just like me, you know. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is his piece uh, called that ba that bagel rag, <laughs> and it's subtitled a trombone schmear. <laughs> now there. I gotta explain what that means, because it's pretty cool. Uh, hang on, hang on, where is it? Here it is. This composition subtitle contains a rather obscure musical joke. During the ragtime era, trombonist Henry Fillmore composed a number of rags featuring chromatic rips of grace notes, which he referred to as trombone smears. 
This rag features several of those same tricks, as well as melodies in the traditional klezmer scales, making it a trombone schmear. <laughs> okay, I don't know if I'll be able to do this justice, but we'll give it a shot. Okay, that bagel rag. Got like he's he's got the 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 compositional chops of Scott Joplin, but he's also got the like sense of humor of yeah. Zez Contra. He's just having such a good time with his own music. Uh, I just love him so much. Anyway, I wish I could just play the, his whole book tonight, but okay, we'll wait. We'll wait. Okay, <laughs> get right on that. <laughs> um. Okay. Oh, this is the last one of the evening. Oh. Look, these are hard for me to learn. <laughs> This is a year of, uh, of, of work that I'm doing right now. Um, 
Uh, let's do. Should we do yeah, a little, a little more? Um, yeah. What? Thank you. Thank you. Oh shit! I forgot to put. I'm gonna put a tip bucket up there. I'll put it up after. <laughs> I didn't bring you all here to hustle you, but you know, I, w I would like a new sustain pedal, and they don't seem to grow yeah. in trees. So. <laughs> you have your Venmo and your PayPal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do all that. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about a little something in music. Um, very, very basic little trick called a triplet. Who knows what a triplet is? <laughs> Uh, what is the definition of a triplet? A triplet is where you play three notes in the space of two. Wow, that sounds mathy. What is the what's what's the effect of a triplet? Well, you can get different effects depending on how you use them. If you string a bunch together, it can create this polyrhythmic flowing feeling. Like in uh, we've had some examples tonight. Like uh, grandfather's clock was a triplet. Arabian Maid used a lot of them. Uh, triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it. Okay, so that's if you string a bunch together. Um, you can also use them isolated, and if you use them in the right context, you can create this sort of tripping, uh, instable, unstable, like falling feeling. And that's what this next piece is going to do. Um, as an example of what I'm talking about, because this sounds all mathy. Um, <laughs> If I were to play the introduction to this next piece, um, slowed down, uh, just in straight eighth notes, it's an eight bar tension building chromatic nightmare of an introduction. <laughs> and uh, straight eighth notes would sound sort of like this. All eighth notes have the same weight. Now, if we threw one triplet at the beginning of every measure, you get that whoops, like tripping feeling um, like this. Now the reason I'm boring you with this lecture on triplets is because this next piece, almost every measure starts with a single triplet and the music's going by at such a blazing speed that the effect is one of total instability, perhaps danger, um, <laughs> like the train is going to fly off the tracks at any second. Um, and it's <laughs> totally unsustainable. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. All right. Um, and the, honestly, the train may fly off the tracks because it's me playing a song I have no business playing. This is way above my pay grade, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, oh, and this one is called... <laughs> this one is called Coaxing the Piano. Coaxing. Oh, no, it looks more like I'm fondling the piano. <laughs> What's under here? <laughs> no pedal, tell you how much. All right. All right. Coaxing the piano. I gotta limber up for this. This requires jazz hands. All right. <clears throat> don't fuck up, don't fuck up. Go slow, go slow.
much for coming tonight. Oh, thank you for doing it. Okay. And I am, I, if, if you're interested, I am going to put a little tip bucket up here with, with like a Venmo sticker on it or something. If you want to. You don't have to, but if you, whatever. You know. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because it's unsustainable. I wish everyone had a story. Yes. Meow, meow, meow.